You can collectively hear the anime community try to argue that we all watch The Eminence and Shadow for the plot, and the plot being all of the Delta action that they so shamelessly throw in our face, and most importantly, Sid's face. And it's not even just like they give you a chest full of Delta, they even give you the backside, bro. And the fact that we go from puppy play at the start to just the absolute savagery that we end up with sister killing brother so casually, and Sid just being like, well, I guess if he's got a lot of kids, I mean, one less ain't gonna hurt. This episode was amazing, it was hilarious, but damn if it isn't hard to just, you know, not want to look at the plot that they so shamelessly throw in your face. But goddamn, that's the eminence and shadow for you. Full live reaction to today's uh, pretty insane episode over on my Patreon if you would like to see that. It's over there if you're interested. This was probably the most, like, pure entertaining episode in terms of just laughing oh my god this is like peak eminence and shadow like yeah there's more explosive episodes as seen by last week but i think what an episode like this does a great job at is it is it brings me right back to what initially hooked me into this show and that was the way sid dealt with the bullshit how the misunderstandings and how it spins into such a ridiculous moment but also how it breaks so many isekai rules that you normally expect and what i mean in that case is if you look at the end of the episode you know usually when a main character that we're following, whether that's a side character or the main character in question, comes back into contact with some long-lost relative, even if that long-lost relative is clearly going to stab us in the back the first moment he gets, they prey on our emotions. Hey, don't you remember me, sis? You know, this, that, and the third. And while I knew the man was probably going to end up dead, I also wasn't expecting it as quickly as it happened. I thought maybe we'd get some information or something, maybe he would try to stab and then something would happen. And instead, Delta's just like, don't call me Sarah, I don't give a shit about you, and then stabs him with her tail. And just the fact that Sid can just so casually be like, you sure you want to do that? Oh yeah, sure, I mean, if your dad got hundreds of kids, who who, who cares, right? He's got, he's got them to spare. And it's like, that's the beauty of this show, is that it doesn't play by the rules you've expected, and because of that, we could have Sid navigating the world, getting upset, thinking that, his little minions are doing things and ruining the world to then getting a Ponzi scheme going and just how he wants to print money for days before getting totally and utterly crushed and leaving that train in shame. We don't know where the show is going to go, so him eating a cup of ramen, I mean, you're thinking, okay, he's just relaxing, enjoying time, like, wait, did he get a dog? And then it all comes back, he's like, oh, wait, he's always had a dog, and just the Delta-ness is just, it's hilarious that it doesn't matter if she's almost butt-ass naked or she's in her full-ass uniform. She straddles Sid the same damn way, and honestly, I gotta give him major props. His posture is perfect. Like, she's literally like, flipping over on his face, bouncing backwards, she's, she's riding him and not really in the most fun of ways, and his posture is rock solid, man. Like, that dude just doesn't flinch, but then again, I guess he had a rough day that not much could move him anymore, especially given uh, the whole fake money and everything like that. That was a really funny moment because when you look at the after the credits of episode three, we knew that this lady was going to be important in some way, right? I mean, he meets up when I was thinking, oh man, shadowing her, what's going on? Turns out he's got a bit of a new disguise, Mr. John Smith, and the whole idea that that cart ride, you know, the carriage ride on the train, just the fact that he's so like, into this moment he's so like what do you see and like what do you think of the the currency and he's giving like a real lesson on how money and currency does work in the world and clearly how it would work in this world and then the fact that he gets so pissed off when she starts like speaking facts that he gets up like what did you say what do you mean like his va so often sid's va doesn't really go that extreme he's pretty neutral most scenes but damn if moments like these or the moment with his two pals, I had to rewind this moment when he just had to, like his VA almost sounds like a completely different character sometimes and it's hilarious. But I love the fact that like he's shaking her down, she thinks it's some sort of test and he just realizes once again, like he's just, he just walks out of there like, it's kind of like the walk of shame in the morning after realizing you slept with the wrong person, but in this case, it seems like Sid had the walk of shame just realizing that maybe his plays weren't actually going to go completely according to plan. Like, this man's just looking for his retirement opportunity at any possible moment, and I absolutely love it. I mean, they pretty much start this episode off talking about how the war has begun, so you knew we were going to get into something pretty crazy. 
And I just love how, you know, if you look at the first couple of episodes of season two, it definitely was getting the momentum going, getting us back in the saddle. But man, between three and four, this just feels like we're back into peak Eminence and Shadow, like some of the best stuff from season one. And it is just so fun. Like, I don't know if they'll ever do more Isekai Quartet after that movie, but they got it. If they do, they have to bring in my boy Sid because his character, just the way he navigates, the way he creates BS but at the same time, Navigate SPS is so fantastic. But I think one of my favorite smaller details about this world is how this isekai environment is being modernized into what looks like Japan, right? Because of things he said, you know, basically just pulling things from his memory and translating it into this new environment. And sometimes it's really noticeable where you're like, that scene looks completely modern. And then at other points it feels half fantasy, half modern. And I love the fact that by the end of the show, probably even before the end of the show, like before the story's completely wrapped up, you're probably not going to be able to differentiate between either Japan or this world. Because that's how quickly things are evolving. And I love the idea, whether it's simply the idea of, well, okay, do you want to carry around a pocket full of coins or would you want paper bills that are almost weightless? To just the suits, the, you know, like there's fine china that you can probably recognize from your grandma's like cupboard, right? Like just everything about it is just, it's the little attention to detail moments that really help this world continue to feel like it's evolving, even if we're not necessarily having Sid focus on it for this episode or multiple episodes. We're seeing the world evolve, and Shadow Garden is truly making a big difference, and honestly causing some waves, causing a ruckus, and other business owners, we can see what it's doing to them in terms of counterfeits and everything, and it's just really good world building in my opinion. I really think that's kind of like the brilliance of a show like this, is that you can honestly just watch it for the laughs and have a great time. You can watch it for the over the top, oh my god, the misunderstandings, look at these big action pieces, and you'll have a good time. And you can be someone who likes to see how an isekai environment evolves and change with the addition of someone who has all these modern ideas, but in this case, it's not necessarily because he's wanting to do it, it's because he tells some people and he just assumes they're chunies like him, and then in return, we get what we see. But when you combine it all together and like all of those elements, you truly do have one of the most entertaining isekai that have come out in the past few years. And I hope they just continue to make it, continue to adapt it. I hope those light novels continue to sell like hotcakes so we can just keep on printing money for everyone. And in return, we can feel like we're at an all-you-can-eat buffet and we're just dealing with Sid's nonsense. And honestly... I'm excited to see where we go because honestly, when any character pops up that could be a boss fight, you could easily one shot him, easily annihilate him, or it could be something a little more intense. But either way, I'm sure Sid will find a way to navigate it even if he doesn't quite understand what's happening or maybe understand uh, how to be a little more uh, compassionate such as like, oh yeah, you know, kill, kill one of his kids. Eh, he's got others to spare. That's just Sid nonsense for you in the Eminence and Shadow. But let me know what you thought of the... Uh, thick plot episode that we got this week let me know your feelings down below leave a like if you enjoyed subscribe if you're new around here of course ring that bell so you can get notified when i upload more videos to the channel and like i mentioned we do have a full live reaction over on my patreon if you're interested and hey while you're there you also get a video shout out so today we have jessica compton fate snake eater 7 nathan semichuk govark and zeshram so i appreciate the support everyone please take care and have a good one